you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you because um, I've, I've been here just over a month and a half and you've made, made me extremely, those of you who I've talked to, some of you I, <laughs> I haven't talked to, those of you I have have made me feel very welcome. So, so thank you for that. The second is I had a, a three and a half hour induction this morning to the University of Westminster. Um, so I hope this is slightly more interesting than the three and a half hours that I experienced. Um, but I, I am now fully inducted, fully induced and able to give this presentation legitimately. So that, that was good. Um, this paper fits in with a trajectory of work that I've been involved in, which um, Roland mentioned on um, democratic innovation. Um, I've been particularly interested in the relationship between democratic theory and practice, um, hence the attraction of coming to work with, with um, some of you at, at uh, CSD. Uh, I've, much of the work on democratic innovation has, in, in recent um, years, has focused on particularly deliberative democracy and then deliberative democracy and its critics and the questions of the institutional forms that deliberation <coughs> and other forms of participatory democracy might take. In a sense, that is where a lot of the work that I've, that I've done in this area sits and that's kind of engagement in political decision making, engagement of citizens in political decision making. Um, very much focused on, on a, on a ver fairly traditional view of the political, very much of sort of uh, government decision making. And one of the attractions of looking at associative democracy is thinking through the theory practice connection outside of that traditional focus on, on, on what might be seen as a limited um, view of the political. So I've always had this interest in Paul Hurst's work and I want to talk about his theory of associative democracy because I've always seen him um, travelling on, on a different line to much of contemporary democratic theory. And the second reason I got interested in associative democracy oh yeah, was because um, Southampton um, ho was home to the Third Sector Research Centre with, uh, with Birmingham, which was funded by the SRC. And I was involved in that centre primarily to, to work on environmental and climate change issues, which is my, the, other, the other area I have an interest in. But there was a theory strand in that. And one of the interesting things that I noticed was I was the only political theorist stroke political scientist working in that theory strand. The theorists were mostly sociologists and or people from business studies. And it made me realise actually it might sound a bit odd but there aren't that many political theor democratic theories in which associations are really central. Associations are usually uh, a secondary aspect to the theory. And I noticed with, with, with Paul Hurst's idea of associative democracy, associations are there, they're, they're up front, they're in the title. And so it was, I, I thought it would be interesting to explore his idea in relationship to the practical agenda that, that, that the Third Sector Research Centre had. So I'm going to be fairly discursive around this. I'm going to mostly focus on a paper that, that was mentioned that's been published recently in Economy and Society and then develop some of those arguments a bit more. Um, I don't know whether I should apologise or not, but the three or four papers that I've experienced in the centre so far have been very dense and people have been reading um, at incredible speed uh, through extremely long, turgid texts. Some very interesting papers. But, um, so I thought they were interesting, <laughs> um, but I kind of have a slightly different style and it involves a couple of overheads to keep myself on track and also for quotes, but also be a bit discursive. If you want to read the, the turgid text, go and read the Economy and Society article. I just want to talk around some of the issues that, that I think are of interest there. Um, so I, don't, I hope I don't get, I hope I haven't got off for a bad start because I'm using PowerPoint. Maybe, there, maybe there's a rule here, I'm not sure, but I'll, I'll find out. Um, so the interesting thing for me with, with Paul Hurst is in this move, from a, move away from this sort of focus on um, citizen engagement on a, on, on, in traditional um, governmental level or um, decision making, he focuses more on the democratisation of welfare governance and also the governance of economic organisations. I think what's interesting about his theory is it occupies a space between market liberalism and social democracy. Um, and I think it does it in a very clever way. Now, I don't, I don't want to say I am someone who wants to follow Paul Hurst. My interest here is if, we've, if, you've, if this theory holds water and it, and it is interesting, what are the kind of practical consequences of this? And, what kind of, my, and very often I find through thinking about the practical consequences, we learn quite a lot about the theoretical ideas. 
I want to be clear that I'm talking about associative democracy as in the work of Paul Hurst, not the associative democracy of Cohen and Rogers, which is the American brand, which is really a, a theory of uh, neo-corporatism or a theory of uh, uh, within the pluralist US tradition. And so it is very much located within, within, um, with, a, with a very clear focus on, focus on Hurst. So um, one of the reasons, again, that I got interested in this um, is because I also thought reading Hearst there was resonance with the current policy agenda. This was towards the end of the New Labour period I started re reading this work and they started getting very interested in mutualism. But even more so as we sort of came in with the, with the conservative rhetoric around um, big society and some of the stuff coming out of Ray's Publica. And I've showed these quotes that there was a, and there was a conference uh, on Paul Hurst's work with a lot of people who'd been writing on, on this area. And uh, I showed these quotes, again this might get me thrown out, um, uh, to the audience there uh, without attributing them. So the first one I was talking about, the size and scope and role of government in Britain has reached the point to, act with, to which it's now inhibiting, not advancing progressive aims, it's undermining personal and social responsibility, it's failing to promote social solidarity, selfishness and individualism. And I got a lot of nodding of heads and yes, this is very good, this is the kind of thing Paul Hurst was, was suggesting. And then that actually it isn't a simplistic retrenchment um, of the state and it's not uh, a, a, a turn to market liberalism won't solve the kinds of problems that we've got from uh, the, of the bureaucratic state. And that actually the answer probably le le lies in the panoply of civic organisations and this point you have a lot of people nodding. And at that point I, I showed that this was actually the speech by um, David Cameron from the uh, Hugo Young lecture from 2009 when he was introducing the, uh, when he was introducing the, the idea of the big society. But actually um, anyone who is a good Hurstian would probably if I, I mean, these are take, taken completely out of context, which you can do, which obviously you can, uh, would, uh, there's a wider context within this. But all I was trying to say, show was that there were certain resonances, even within the current conservative ag agenda of sort of, um, of pluralisation and decentralisation of power and, and questions around the governance of society. And this does, to a certain extent, as I say, resonate uh, with, um, w with, with the kind of work that Hearst was putting forward. Also, it's a very good way of getting a, a cheap laugh, but that's a, that's a separate issue. But the resonances here are quite clear. Um, but of course there are, and there are, but of course there is a big but. I mean, quite clearly what, what he was talking about is not, is not a uh, big society. For Hearst, and, and this is, I, I've kind of tried to summarise Hearst's ideas about, um, particularly around um, welfare governance, in a, in a, in a, very simply. And I think they have been very much misunderstood. And it's very in interesting how often you see people talking about an enhanced role for associations or developing civil society and then putting Hearst 1997 after it. The, this is not what Hearst was arguing. Hearst is arguing for a complete restructuring of the relationship between states and associations with associations taking on the role of welfare provision. He argues that there's a contradiction in the state, that the state is both the overseer of the services and the provider of the services. Actually it's overseeing its own provision which causes all sorts of, all sorts of problems. So he's, he, in his theory he argues that associations should be provided by voluntary and self-governing associations. Now of course this is where we depart from the kind of uh, mainstream um, governmental approach both under New Labour and, um, and, under, and, under the conser and under the conservative Liberal Democratic um, government in that the provision of welfare services for them is, is whoever the provider is who's cheapest. Now what, what Hearst is quite clear about is the private sector should have no part to play in this, the private corporate sector. That actually delivery of services is something that should be done by associations. So it's against the kind of mixed economy at the moment, which tends to be dominated by private corporations rather than by associations. The second thing that Hearst argues is that um, associations then compete for members. So they deliver particular services to a particular standard that is required by government. And at that point, there's a competition. So you don't have what we have at the moment, which is a single organisation wins a contract from a government and then delivers that service for the next five years. The idea is that service can be delivered by any association uh, that puts itself forward, that is voluntary and self-governing and has a degree of democratic organisation. And that they receive funds those associations receive their funding proportional to the number of to the number of members they have.
Now this is actually, this is where Hearst's theory I think is, its most, is at its most interesting. It has competition within it, but competition between voluntary associations and that competition and the, if you like, the, the funding or the financing of those organisations, the public funds following the individuals. We can see this to a certain extent, just to sort of, uh, in, in terms of the way that uh, individual uh, social services, personal, personalised social services are, be, are being delivered in this country, where, where individuals get a budget um, and they can buy those services from the state or they can buy them from private sector organisations and voluntary organisations. What Hearst is doing is saying, actually, we're just going to leave this to you know, the only place that you can, you can um, get these services are from voluntary associations. This can be done through tax credits, it can be done through vouchers, all sorts of different ways. Now, what Hearst says is important about this is this actually ensures two democratic rights for citizens. The first is the right of voice within those associations, because those associations being self-governed mean that uh, members have, have some degree of participation within the day-to-day -day life of those associations. I'll talk a bit more about that as we go along. But crucial for him is the right of exit. If you are not happy with the service that you are being provided and think another association can provide it better, then you can leave the association you're in. There'll be a period of time each year when you can leave associations and you can move to another one. And he says that's a really powerful right. That right of exit shouldn't be underestimated. Within democratic theory, we particularly focus on, on um, he argues, constructing the institutions for voice. What we have less to say about is the democratic power that exit has when you're not happy with something and moving to, 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 another, to another association. So for him, this is obviously sort of looking at the way, he, he's directly quoting the work of, of, of Hirschman here on exit voice loyalty and saying, you know, within democratic theory, we've been very strong on voice. What we haven't realized is that how powerful, how powerful exit can be. So it isn't, his theory isn't just a matter of thinking about um, in, in, enhancing the role of associations per se. It's about enhancing the role of associations within a particular institutional uh, framework in which there is competition between those associations, in which, in which public funding for services follows the, in, follows the decisions of, of citizens. So this becomes a sort of democratic theory of welfare. And he actually argues for those of you, I mean, I'm going to focus on the welfare aspect, but if anyone wants to discuss it, this is also a theory of economic governance and we as, as well. He's trying to, he actually argues that, the, that, the for, that what we have at the moment for the for-profit for economy, we should move much more towards associations with, we should move beyond what he calls the republic of shareholders to uh, much more participatory or, or, or democratic forms of economic governance. And I'll talk a bit about um, how that might occur. So one thing he wants to make clear, and one thing I want to make clear, is I don't think this is an out and out, and I think this has been said, that this is an apology for economic liberalism. This is very different from economic liberalism. It's a different type of, uh, of, of relationship between the state and, and the third sector or, 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 um, or associations. It is quali a qualitatively different theoretical perspective. And I think one of the problems is Hearst kind of, people don't read Hearst. They read commentators on Hearst. And I think there's some really interesting ideas in here, particularly about that I, I, idea of uh, that idea of exit. So he uh, ex explicitly, as a quote from Hearst, um, it, he wants to distance himself quite clearly from economic liberal arg arguments. Um, it says, unlike economic liberal doctrine, doctrines that seek to limit the functions of the state and expand the scope of the market, associationalism seeks to expand the scope of democratic governance in civil society. It also, like free market doctrine, promotes choice through competition, but it does so by giving individuals the option to move between non-profit making associations. Individuals have voice within associations and the periodic option to move between them. Now, as somebody who'd been doing work on um, democratic, uh, on sort of the, uh, around uh, deliberative democracy and participatory democracy and sort of engagement with state institutions and state decision making. Reading this was a very interesting exercise for me because it really sort of, it, 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 it forced me to think in a, in a, in a slightly different vernacular in a, in a, in a way or in a, in, and in a form of uh, democratic engagement different from what I saw as the sort of the dominant stream of thinking. But as is, you know, and, and he, Hearst is primarily a, a, a theorist, and um, what he doesn't give us much detail on is, is the forms of organisation. He talks about self-governing and voluntary organisations, and he talks about the need for a process of, 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 of reform. But 
beyond that, he really doesn't get into the details of what it is we were talk what, what we're talking about. So, what I have been trying to do is to think through if we take Hearst if we take Hearst theory as uh, well, not not completely as given, but if we if we're interested in in Hearst theory, how might it be? put into practice and what might we learn from trying to put it into practice and how, how it might be uh, how it might be enabled that, that will help us reflect reflect back on theory and in a sense that's part of the the, the the journey or the process I'm on at the moment I don't you know I'm, I'm I'm at the moment starting to think again about the theory of a social democracy having thought about some of its practical implementation so some of the thoughts towards the end haven't really haven't aren't that well developed but what I have developed is some thoughts around how do you start to move towards this and really that becomes comes a, 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 a discussion of how do you regulate associations because quite clearly associations will need to be regulated associations that are under receipt of public funds need to be regulated now how do you do that and that's where um, some of the work that I came across when I was working in the third sector research centre really started to um, really started to resonate and this was particularly in reading the work from um, continental Europe, particularly from France and from Belgium, um, and my apologies for my pronunciation, around uh, the economy sociale, or what we in English uh, would refer to as the social economy. Um, and what I found particularly interesting about this work was, uh, and, I, and I went to a couple of conferences in France for, of, of social economy scholars. Um, this is a term which isn't very, oft, very much used. It was used by... Uh, people in a different way about 10, 20 years ago, thinking about um, the, na the nature of the economy, about how to embed social values within the economy rather than the way it's thought of in France. There is a discipline in France of, of, on the social economy. If you go into French bookshops, there are rows and rows of books on social economy. My French is really not very good, but it has been one of the incentives for me to try and improve my French, simply because there is a discipline here which is on the borders of sociology and politics, and, uh, and which we, do, we just simply don't have. In this, have in this country, um, although it's a term that, 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 is, that is starting to move across. So I was quite excited reading this literature and talking to these people and some of the stuff's been uh, translated into, uh, into English because the kinds of things that Hearst was talking about in terms of voluntary and democratic self-governing associations or associations democratically governed by their providers and uh, their consumers really resonated with the work I was finding in, 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 uh, amongst French and Belgian and uh, Italian writers on the social economy. And this is from two, two, two of the well-known ones. This is the kind of definition you find. And the social economy, they, they state, includes all economic activities conducted by enterprises, primarily cooperatives, associations and mutual benefit societies, whose ethics convey the following principles. So placing service of its members or the community ahead of profits, uh, autonomous management, a democratic decision-making process, <coughs> and the primacy of people and work over capital in the distribution of revenues. Well, this is exactly what Hearst is talking about. We have these organisations in the UK, we just don't tend to call them the social economy. It's just we don't, organize, we don't think about them as an organised group in the same way. That may be because we've been dominated by a conception of charity. Um, historically, but th that, that's for, for, for another discussion. And more recently we've seen the emergence in this country of social enterprise as an idea of, um, uh, of organisation. This is a particular group of social economy organisations, the idea of the social entrepreneur, of the self-financing civil society organisation, a risk-taking organisation. And in the literature on this, again, they talk about the participatory nature of these forms of organisations. So I was very excited because I've been reading this theoretical work and at the same time I started reading this practical work and I thought, oh, well, maybe I've come across, I'm beginning to uh, get a better grasp of how the kind of theoretical ideas that Hearst has could be, could be realised in, in, in practice. And we are talking about a wide range of organisations. We aren't just talking about cooperatives. The kinds of things we would be, that would fall under this title include social and community enterprises, building societies, charity trading arms, consumer retail societies, credit unions, fair trade companies, housing associations, local exchange trading schemes, marking cooperatives, mutual co-ops, social firms, time banks. I mean, the list is, there is a, this is a plethora of different types of organisations that would fit within this kind of idea of the social economy and would fit under Hearst's, under Hearst's uh, theoretical forms. 
And this is not an insubstantial group of, um, of organisations as well. Within the EU, apparently, just under 7% of people work in social economy organisations already. And that's typically without the structures in place to, to, to boost their, their profile. That's approximately 11 million people. And they're kind of found in industries such as health, financial services, education, housing, employment, etc. But what's, what I found interesting about this is I hadn't come across this at all in democratic theory, in the theoretical work I've been reading. And it, it made me realise there was a sort of this area of democratic engagement that was, that was occurring that really hasn't been theorised. Of course there was this work in the 70s and 80s on the workers' cooperatives. This is where sort of market socialism work was, was going at that particular moment in time. But not the kind of breadth of organisations that were under this. was a very specific organisational form and it made me realise you know, it's kind of lacuna in, in, in democratic thinking around welfare provision and around, um, and around um, economic governance which is just a sort of silent, I, it's the heavy hand of deliberative democracy I think and I, and I you know, I've just plead some, um, you know, I, I've probably been part of that debate myself but we've been so focused on the kind of uh, state-based political decision making, these other arenas seem to have kind of disappeared at least from the work that I've been reading. Now for the question then becomes, if we have these sorts of organisations and they, and they do resonate with, with the sort of, um, with the, with the uh, forms that, uh, that Hearst is proposing, how do we begin to think about moving towards an associational provision of welfare? In, in the way that, uh, that, that Hearst is suggesting. And that for me becomes a regulatory challenge because for me I don't think it can be something that's going to happen organically. We know that co-ops co -ops don't compete um, well under current market conditions. The current market discriminates quite clearly in favour of the authority structure of the capitalist firm. I mean otherwise we would have more co-ops. And, so, and, the, and, the, and the, the market is organised for the benefit of those sorts of organisations. So therefore you are going to have to give some sort of fiscal advantage or some regulatory advantage to these particular forms. Then the question becomes, how do you do that? Now, slightly easier somewhere in somewhere like France where there is a particular legal definition, a, le a legal form and a legal definition of the social economy. And those social economy organisations in principle fulfil these, these, um, the, these particular principles. Now, we can talk about whether that's the case or not in actual practice. More difficult in this country uh, where we have a range of different organisational forms and this is what much of the paper, and I, I'll spare you uh, the details of it, but this is what much of the paper is focusing on, which is looking at those regulatory forms and the extent to which they support democratic forms of organisation. And if the, the, the forms of social econo economy, the, the, the social economy organisations that I've been discussing will have one or more of these forms. So you could have charity and company limited by guarantee, etc. Now, these are well-established forms. Charity goes, charitable status goes back to uh, 1601. Um, I, uh, the Industrial and Providence Society, 1852, and friendly societies from 1834 from before then. These are well-established forms of organisation. More recent one is the Community Interest Company, which was established under, under Labour in 2005 of which there are now about five and a half thousand. And this is a very flexible structure, a purposefully uh, flexible structure, which has an asset log. So it does fit within the social economy, um, where assets, where profits must be used for the benefit of the community. There is, a, there is now a, a CIC regulator, um, in the same way there's an IPS regulator. Uh, but what's interesting about Kicks, and there was a, a sort of 60 page policy document that was that was produced in the, in the mid-2000s, which I was involved in discussions around, um, where there is only one paragraph in the 60 pages about the internal structure of that organisation. Um, it, it, it says nothing about the defining characteristics. It does not require a democratic form. Now, what I think is interesting is the kind of... This actually re really is... As, as why it fits so well with Hearst. This is really a normative account of the social economy because in practice many of the organisations that we might think of as social economy organisations simply don't have that democratic structure, don't have those forms of, of, um, uh, of uh, it don't enable participation. There is no requirement within charity law or within CLGs or within CLSs or within CICs to, um, to require 
those organisations to to engage both with workers, members, community, the, commu uh, the geographical community, etc. So we have a problem here, which is a mismatch between the existing regulatory, the existing forms, the existing legal forms, and the um, desire theoretically to uh, to sort of prioritise democratic forms of engagement. As I say there, the legal framework that we have is simply too permissive to set about thinking about in, uh, um, developing an associative democracy. Unless we just wanted to stick with IPS. I think there might be good reason to just stick with IPS, but politically it ain't going to happen. Politically it's not going to happen because for both the Conservatives and for Labour, they, review, they, they perceive IPS as a sort of, um, as a rather old-fashioned form of organisation. So your one, one idea would be to identify a particular legal form and give that priority. The second, of course, would be to have a social clause, when, which is that any organisation that wants to engage in the delivery of services or wants to take fiscal advantage of being in the social economy must display minimal, minimal standards of democratic practice. They may, I mean, you can have democratic forms of organisation, it's just not required under most of these. Although then that would require quite an interesting, and this is where you, know, you begin, to get, uh, begin to think, what would a democratic regulator look like? I'm quite interested, that's a quite interesting question actually. How would you regulate democratic form? Um, in the same way as people think about how do you regulate corporate social responsibility, how do you regulate, um, how do you regulate environmental uh, considerations? This generates quite an interesting, I think, quite an interesting democratic paradox because um, that begins to start to think about how much democracy would you be interested in. Now, Hearst actually is very minimal when it comes to this, and I was quite surprised. And my initial reaction was one of, actually, that's quite disappointing. Um, and he talks about the rules being applied should be as few as consistent with preventing oppression of members and denying them choice. In practice, this amounts to the guarantee of the right of exit and ensuring one member, one vote for, for the, uh, the board. Well, well, that's pretty poor. Southampton University wasn't very far from that. I mean, it's quite, actually, it's quite a long way from it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, um, I, I was able to exit. I came here and I was, uh, and I was able to stand for, the, uh, stand for Senate. But um, anyway, um, again, in a second quote, saying a similar kind of thing. Now, when I was putting on my sort of stronger participatory hat on, I thought this is a real opportunity to you would be a real opportunity to use the regulatory, to use regulatory frameworks to to enhance the degree of democracy we should expect from associations. And if you've got a sort of, this is, this is sort of the direction of travel of democratic theory at the moment. Let's put in, let's put in particular clauses that require, a, require particular modes of deliberation or require particular um, modes of participation. Let's be positive in our democratic intervention. Because we know that in practice, most social economy organisations, even if they claim to be democratic, don't really live up to the kind of expectations that most democratic theories have. <coughs> And I was thinking, you know, I was thinking, OK, we could do that, but should we do that? And actually, this is where I began to realise the kind of interesting take that, that, that Hearst has on associative democracy. And I began to kind of like pull out his, um, his argument. And his argument was actually that the negative right of exit is way more important than, than, than overdoing voice. That actually it's exit we should be really interested in as democratic theorists within, within this account of democracy. As long as there's a minimal standard of democracy, that's fine. And he has a number of arguments which I've kind of pulled out from his work to, to explain that. Why that was the case. His first is quite an interesting one. Sorry, I squeak then, but um, <laughs> happens. <laughs> happens when I get excited. Um, the first is um, a serious issue of, of the potential to undermine choice. By prescribing particular rules and particular practices within associations, um, it, it, individuals would have less choice of types of organisation that they could join. Those people who want to join a highly participatory organisation will be free to join a highly participatory organisation. Those that are happy with more minimum standards of democracy can go to those associations which display more minimum standards. Why prescribe the highest expectations of democracy and expect all associations to, to, to play that game? Because he's saying what you're going to do, and this leads into the second point, they are distinct, but I think it does lead to the second point, you are going to lead to incredible level of institutional isomorphism. The power of the social economy is its variety. 
It's variety of different forms of association. It's variety of, of different practices of engagement. If you actually try to, say, prescribe what associations do, they're all going to start to look like each other. And that diversity, which is the most attractive part of the social economy, and the ability to respond to different needs, particular cultural needs, etc., um, uh, will be lost. And thirdly, and I think in many ways this is a, a killer argument, um, is it would lead to unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of it, it rests on a stronger democracy rests on unrealistic ex expectations of what citizens are likely to do. Because as citizens we may be members of, we would be here, be members of a plurality of associations delivering different types of services to us. Do we want to be highly participatory in all of those associations all of the time? Chances are not. If you want to be more participatory, go and find those participatory associations, but most people aren't going to have the time or desire to do that. If the people, he says, are satisfied with what they get from minimum commitment, so be it. If they aren't, exit and go to one where there is more opportunity to, to, to engage. So, and I think the interesting thing about this is the point, the association system doesn't intrinsically require a huge degree of involvement. There can be huge degrees of involvement if people want to, but it doesn't actually absolutely require that. So in many ways that's actually where the, the work that I was doing in, in terms of formal publications uh, stopped, which was to say, which was to kind of make this connection between um, Hearst's theory of associative democracy, the practical work that's emerging around the social economy, and then to question this idea of, begin to unpack this idea of how you might regulate it. I think it raises some interesting questions about, I think this is a really interesting term actually, regulating democracy and regulating democratic practice. It seems to be, uh, it seems to be slightly a uh, um, strange concept, but I think it's a, it, it, it is what we do when we create institutions. We regulate democratic practice. And of course, the, 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 the sort of default mode of many democratic theories is to make that more and more intense, that, that experience of democratic engagement. But Hearst, I think, gives us good reasons because plurality of associations is important to respond to the plurality of of needs and interests that we as, as a community have. So the, what I'm working on at the moment, and I had hoped to do more on, we always hope to do more on, don't we, when we agree to do a paper, um, is, uh, is a series of sort of other issues which I think um, are worthy of attention. I'm just going to describe, just sort of just discuss these very briefly and then, um, and then move on to, to, to questions. The first um, is this idea of exit which I think is really intriguing and I think is a really, when, when you move into, you can't exit the state, well you can exit the state, it's quite, quite problematic and quite tiresome and quite difficult, but you then try, tend to enter another state which is difficult to, to exit. So one of the points here is, is the power of exit, um, I think is a really, for, for, within, within the work that, I, that I'm familiar with, is, is a sort of less, thought about um, idea than the, than, than, than the capacity for voice. But I think if we are thinking about associations and particular forms of welfare, I think it differs between different areas and different, um, what they call, it sounds, it sounds odd, what they, what they call within third sector studies, different industries. Because I think it's easier to think about competition between associations in the provision of, for example, personal social services or pensions, well, health care, education, than it is, for example, in housing. It is not easy to exit one housing association and move to another. In the state, you know, that's a much more difficult thing to do than it is to move a provider of a, of a pension or of personal social services. Um, and I want to do some more work on that. I think, it, I think it's got to be much more careful. It may, that, what that may entail is that in certain forms of welfare provision, where exit is less is less easy or more difficult, um, you might then need to think about the question of voice much more carefully. I think where competition and competition of the form that Hearst is talking about, not economic competition that the, the economic liberals are talking about, the kind of competition where that competition is restricted because of the character of the, of the um, form of welfare, we may well need to have a different re a rebalancing of voice 
un under that particular context. I haven't really thought this through enough, but there's certainly a huge literature out there about within on public services about capacity to to uh, about exit voice loyalty. And I'm I'm trying to mine that a bit more. The second thing that really struck me recently um, was actually one pro slightly problematic aspect of this, potentially this theory, is the pressure it would put on people who are recipients of multiple forms of welfare in terms of the democratic expectations of them. I hadn't really thought this through until, um, until uh, just before Christmas, and I haven't thought it through enough now, but I think it's a really interesting point to, 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 to think about is that it's the economic, most economically and socially marginalised who typically have, uh, rely on a series of different wealth forms of welfare provision. And that they would then be members of a variety of different types of associations in order to leave that dividend. Now, I wouldn't need to be a member of that many associations. I would actually, you know, I'm thinking about the kind of, you know, pension maybe uh, in, in terms of GP care. It would be a reduced number. But someone who is on benefits, who is uh, who, who's uh, getting the housing through a housing association, maybe um, has some sort of form of disability, has health problems, etc. They have much more intense engagement, much more intense forms of. Uh, I mean, it's uh, potentially the increased democratic demands would be skewed towards those who were more socially marginalised, more economically marginalised. That's that's what it seems to me. That seems to be the logic of what Hurst is saying. I have to think about that more, a bit more carefully, but I think that's an interesting thing, perhaps something we could, we could discuss more. And at, uh, about a couple of years ago, when I made a presentation on, on this, to, uh, which was more on the policy interface, people were also concerned about, at the moment, we have trouble getting people to sit on voluntary sector boards, voluntary organisational boards with the right skills. Would we actually be able to manage this array of associations? Now, um, one of the arguments from um, people from the National Council of Voluntary Organisations and others is if they were doing more exciting things and actually had larger budgets, then probably yes is the answer, uh, particularly if they were moving into the traditional economic, in the economic realm. <laughs> the final one I raise is, uh, I haven't, again, I haven't thought about too much, but um, there's a kind of assumption in Hearst that these uh, associations will be more localised, more regionalised, and, and I haven't gone into his account of um, economic democracy, but it's very much focuses on the regional level and, and, and trying to think about public policies to promote regional forms of organisation. But what's to stop these mutuals <coughs> becoming larger? I get my, I, I get my um, pension from, um, or not my pension, sorry, my, my, um, our uh, mortgages through Nationwide. Um, I, I bank with the cooperative and I, um, I use the phone co-op and things, and once a year I get a kind of thing through to, to vote for the board, etc. Um, but you know, these are quite big organisations, and they tend to get, are tending to get bigger at the moment. I think maybe they're trying to get bigger because they've got to compete with large-scale capitalist firms, and that's one of the tendencies. But it is a really interesting question about voice becomes pro more problematic within these organisations the larger they become. And there's also a potential here of for monopoly and for oligopoly. Ol oligop a ligopoly. Oh God! Oh, can you cut that bit? Can you? <laughs> can we cut that bit in the video? <laughs> I was doing so well up to then. I th well, I think I was anyway. Um, and that's an again. We haven't really thought that through. We thought it through in terms in relation to the capitalist firm. But if we are serious about exit and the right of exit, what happens if we start to see mass exit or ma mass joining of one or two? organisations which become to dominate a subfield because the point here is ensuring the potential of exit. Of course, maybe what Hearst says, and he does say it elsewhere, is if people aren't happy with what they've got, they'll start, or they'll start forming other forms of associations. But startup is actually quite a difficult thing to do. So these are the things I want to leave you with because they're on my mind. That isn't at all trying to say this is where we should go because I haven't thought about these, these much in the discussion. But I leave you there. I, I just hope that... Um, for me, reading this stuff, reading the work of Paul Hurst, and for those of you who don't know, Paul sadly died about um, four or five years ago, and it is real, a, a real sad. He was a real, he was a ball of energy, um, and he just took a different perspective. He, he, he just loved to be, um, uh, to sort of uh, go against the, uh, the mainstream. And I think one of the interesting things about associative democracy is how it just doesn't sit comfortably at all with the current trajectory for me of democratic theory and just simply because of that 
And just simply because someone has developed a, a, a way of thinking about democratic practice, which is focused on a different array of organisations and a different relationship of, of power between the state and associations, I think it's worthy of our attention, both at a theoretical level and because of this interest in the policy world of, of associationalism, of actually thinking about it in practical terms as well. So thank you very much.